so I uploaded uh, a the oral contraceptive chart I was talking about. This is actually a little outdated, but uh, the, it still shows the concepts I'm trying to get at because I don't really care that you memorize every single one of these um, products here. But again, I want you to know kind of the concepts behind how we're dosing these things, how we're combining them, etc. cetera. Um, so just to give you an idea, uh, I mean, like this is a pretty big list, right? So there's a, a gazillion different types that are out there, but some things you'll, you'll notice. So for instance, here's, uh, I mentioned the combination extended cycle where basically, oh, and uh, if you see EE on here, that just stands for ethanol estradiol. That's the kind of the most common uh, estrogen product that you'll see used for these, um, or contraceptive products. <clears throat> and so um, the progesterone will be listed here. So things like levonorgestrel we talked about yesterday. Um, and so these are the extended cycle ones. So these are ones that you would have be taking for say several months in a row. And then you'd have say maybe four withdrawal periods like throughout the, the year, so to speak. Um, although some can be just one time a year. So for instance, like the seasonal, it's just a continuous single dose of the progestin and the estrogen together just throughout the year. And then at the end, you can just you know schedule one withdrawal period if you like. Um, but again, you know, see here, they'll, they'll kind of mention the different doses. They'll have that same, you know, progestin and estrogen concentration, say for 84 days. And then you'll just go to one that has just the estrogen sort of as a way to kind of slowly kind of titrate off the dose. That's not strictly necessary, but that's something you'll find in some of these products here. Uh, if you were to find F-E in any of the names, what do you think that means? Iron. Iron. Yeah, it has <laughs> iron in it. Um, iron is included in those products there, which again is, a, is you know, good if your patients are not getting that supplemented, um, you know, through other means. So for instance, you know, like prenatal vitamins or something like that. Um, you know, are you thinking of vitamins? Are they typically like a problem in like overdose? Not usually, especially like if you look at like gummy vitamins, like I'd have kids not the kids calling in, but the parents are calling about the kids and they're like, they ate an entire bottle of gummy vitamins. I'm like, well, that's, yeah, because they look like gummies, so of course kids are going to want to eat them, but um, usually not so big of an issue because they don't really put in, you know, a single dose is not too big of a deal. On the other hand, though, prenatal vitamins can be a big problem because of the iron content. Yes, ma'am. Do you know if the iron is present in the active pills too, or just they should be included all the way throughout. So for instance, like this one here, it's just a monophasic. And so this would have the iron in it all the way throughout. They would list it if there's like a difference between those, but yeah. Um, but you'll find a lot of times in the, the, the placebo pills that actually will have the iron in there as well. So that way they're getting their supplementation all the way throughout the, the month, as opposed to getting like, you know, there's no reason to withdraw them from the iron for that one week, right? <clears throat> But yeah, iron can actually be really bad in overdose. And so that's why you always want to be concerned about asking like, hey, you know, kid ate a bunch of vitamins. If I, it was a mom and, you know, she's looking to get pregnant or maybe been pregnant recently or something like that, it's usually a, a much bigger issue. Um, which we can talk about later on in the class when we get to the toxicology section. But um, again, so we mentioned the monophasic. So in this case here, they would just be getting the same active pill throughout the month, um, same dose of progestin and the estrogen there versus if you were to say, for instance, get into something like, the biphasic ones. We notice here there's one change throughout the month. So for instance, here you'd be doing 10 days of the one and then you switch at day 11 over to the, the, the second dose here. So you notice here they kind of up the dose of the progestin, which is similar to what you would end up seeing in the cycle there towards the kind of the second half. Um, so again, just different ways to skin the same cat, so to speak. Again, depending on when they're having bleeding, that is also, um, you know, why you may change the dosing, why you may change from like a biphasic to a triphasic, something like that. But um, that kind of makes sense, all these different products here. And like I said, when you kind of get used to it, if you're working in a hospital and you're prescribing this, you may only have like one or two available to you that's on formulary. If you're working, you know, in the outpatient realm, you'll have a couple that you probably will do. Um, I think uh, I was mentioning this to Professor Sales yesterday and she's like, yeah, it like depends on, you know, what type of patient you have, you know, what kind of their concerns are in terms of side effects. And I have like three or four that I'll have listed off in terms of options. So, and again, they're, they're definitely not star for options when it comes to oral contraceptives. So let's get into our, uh, some inhibitors and antagonists. You know, we've talked about estrogen and progestin agonists this entire time. We certainly know there's some ways we can inhibit this system here. We've talked about some of them before. We see this used a lot in terms of like um, use for breast cancer and, and treatment for things like that. We mentioned some of these as well in terms of use for um, so with androgens, for instance, right? So you can still use things like GnRH agonists and antagonists will just have different downstream effects and you would see um, with, you know, a male patient versus a female patient in these cases here. So different ways we can do this and, and frequently we're using um, different products here. We can, especially for like ovulatory disorders, you know, we can do things like trying to stimulate ovulation. We'll talk about a few products that can help with that. Um, 
But again, it's all part of that negative feedback loop here we're trying to um, disrupt by either using things like aromatase inhibitors or you know, different um, targets we can shoot for here by affecting different levels. So looking at our selective estrogen receptor modulators or the SERMs, again, these are going to be working as um, agonists in some tissues, antagonists in other tissues. And why do you think we would do that? Yeah, so maybe they have like a high risk of breast cancer. We don't want to stimulate the estrogen receptors in the breast tissue, right? Um, versus why don't we just, you know, if we had someone who we were considering maybe treatment for breast cancer, we want to inhibit estrogen activation in the breast tissue. Why don't we just give a full antagonist and block all the estrogen receptors in the body? Hey, we're about the what issues with the bones specifically they're gonna get osteoporosis, right? And again, um, you'll see a lot of other side effects, you know, the um, atrophic vaginitis, the um, uh, issues with like vasomotor symptoms, all of that. So again, it's like you're inducing menopause for these, these patients here. So that's why it's nice to have something that has some selectivity at different types of uh, tissues there. So for instance, the first one we had here was tamoxifen, which is basically a competitive and a partial agonist and an inhibitor of estradiol. So depending on the tissue you're at, and remember we have those different subtypes of estrogen receptors in the nuclei, depending on which tissue you're dealing with, um, you'd find that it would act as an agonist in the bone and endometrium, but an antagonist in the breast tissue, right? Um, why would this be a problem here based on this activity? If I'm stimulating the endometrial tissue, yeah, there's cancer risk associated with that. So maybe this would be better for patients who maybe have had a hysterectomy where they don't have that tissue there to stimulate. Um, but this was the first one we had, so it wasn't a perfect agent by any means there. Um, and again, based on the chemical structures, able to work with those different heterodimers, depending on the actual um, tissue you're, you're dealing with there. Um, frequently would be end up using, uh, being used for patients that maybe, um, or being used for palliative care, right, for breast cancer, uh, you know, maybe for prevention in high-risk women if you had that family history of estrogen sensitive breast cancer, things like that. Um, but again, you'll see that hot flashes and vomiting pretty common in these patients here, which makes pretty good sense as it being an antagonist to a lot of those estrogen receptors there. Um, other things we can see these being used for though, are gonna be things like you know, prevention of the loss of lumbar spine bone density, because again, it's acting still as an agonist in the bone there. So that's the main benefit that with the agents here it can act as an antagonist in the breast tissue, but an agonist in the bone as you've correctly already identified there. Um, you will find as well that they can have some favorable changes on the lipid profile, just like we see with some estrogen, um, uh, we saw with estrogen yesterday. Um, and then, you know, there could be risk due to the partial agonist activity of things. You can still see things like thromboembolism due to activation of uh, the liver, producing new clotting factors, things like that. So again, not perfect. Um, and vaginal bleeding can occur because again, it's stimulating that tissue down there. So um, not great. Since then, we've had some other agents that you can use that are going to have a little bit better favorable profiles. So for instance, you have like raloxifene or Avista. This one's going to have good estrogenic effects on the lipids and the bones. So maybe help your HDLs up. It will be positive or helping to inhibit those osteoclasts there. But in here, you're going to find that it doesn't stimulate the endometrial tissue or the breast tissue. So you can see why it might be more preferred, especially if patients have an intact uterus there. So um, again, you can either use it for issues of breast cancer or for uh, prevention of postmenopausal osteoporosis. Now we've talked about osteoporosis before, right? How do we normally treat that? Right, so you might see these being used in combination, right? So again, these postmenopausal women, they may have something to help with the estrogen side of things. You're given a bisphosphonate to help inhibit osteoclast activity. Obviously, what else are they gonna be getting? Vitamin D, calcium, right? So make sure they get, so again, you might be using multiple agents there to help manage that, but that's gonna be um, one thing you can see there. Uh, Clomiphene is another agent. This is uh, actually pretty interesting to be used as an ovulation inducing agent. Um, basically, it's kind of an old partial agonist at the estrogen receptors there. And basically, it's going to be binding up these hypothalamic estrogen receptors. Okay. So, by only being, say, a partial agonist there, it's not getting full, let's say, um, full activity. You're not going to find that you're really inhibiting that negative feedback loop, or you're not going to be. Um, activating the negative feedback loop there, what do you think it would do to things like LH and FSH release? Because normally if these patients had way too much estrogen, it would be activating those receptors and would be shutting down release because it says, hey, there's, there's, we have enough estrogen here, we don't have to release any more LH and FSH. So by having a partial agonist there, what do you think it would do? It would increase levels there. So you actually have high LH and FSH levels as a result of using just a partial agonist because that negative feedback loop hasn't really been fully activated. And so you end up finding that they can actually induce ovulation. So that's a pretty common one you'll see for patients who have um, ovulatory disorders that you can um, try to help stimulate that.
Uh, another agent here called Danazol or Danacrin. This one um, is also used to help um, suppress ovarian function. It has kind of uh, multiple activities here. It has maybe weak progestinal activity, androgenic glucocorticoid effects. You, you'll see as it gets kind of dirtier in terms of its mechanism and different receptor types it's hitting, it'll also increase the side effect profile that you'll see there. This one's good because it's used for endometriosis and helps to suppress that ovarian function. So again, by helping to suppress release of LH and FSH, in this case here, you're not stimulating the ovaries to function as, as much, and so that can help out with that endometriosis and help prevent that tissue from being, um, getting more aggravated there. And you'll, you'll see this being used in, say, like, you know, uh, patients improving, you know, over the course of several months or so. Um, interestingly enough, we also use it in a couple of different hematologic uh, disorders, so things like idiopathic uh, thrombocytopenic purpura, um, hemophilia, things like that. You can also get some some decent activity there. So, um, again, by having multiple mechanisms, you know, you can see kind of a wide range of uses for that drug there. As you might imagine. You can see things like weight gain and edema because of those kind of bleed over effects from things like the glucocorticoids. Um, but you may find that you will have sort of, um, you know, by inhibiting the estrogen activity, you're going to see some more of that masculinizing sort of effects there. So things like decreased breast size and uh, deepening of the voice, hair growth, things like that, because you're going to have stronger androgenic effects. And again, this drug itself is androgenic in, in nature. And then we have our aromatase inhibitor. So again, this is an even stronger way to kind of decrease uh, estrogen function here because again, uh, what is this gonna do for us? Now it prevents testosterone converting over into estrogen there. So you have a pretty good um, decrease in level. So obviously if you had to compare side effect profiles between say like this versus say a serum like raloxifene, which one do you think would have worse profile? These ones for sure, right? But they're also more potent. So again, these are uh, good reasons to use it still. Just be aware that the side effect profile is not as uh, favorable for those patients there. So especially if they're uh, resistant to SERMs with their breast cancer, then this is another good option for them. So we have different ones like anastrozole, letrozole, and eximistane. Eximistane is going to have like the strongest activity here because it's actually an irreversible inhibitor. So by um, doing that, basically until you produce new aromatase, as the, the enzyme itself, um, you're going to find that you're not going to be able to um, actually produce any of that new estrogen as a result of that, that conversion process there. So again, um, in terms of risk for fractures, again, what do you think about this? Probably pretty high for this one because again, estrogen levels are going to be dropping quite precipitously. So um, there's certainly a concern there, making sure they're getting kind of taken care of from all the other aspects like the calcium and, and the bisphosphonates and whatnot. So that's it for that. Any questions? on the ob section specifically? No. Okay, um, let us talk about, actually I wanna skip the immunization section right now. I wanna actually go into the nephrology, if that's okay with everyone. You guys all right with that? To be quite fair, you had no choice in the matter regardless. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep talking. Um, this one's a bit more of a spicy meatball in terms of content, so I wanted to make sure I'm hedging my time appropriately. Um, but I think we'll have plenty of time to cover stuff. I may actually have extra time that I will not be using, uh, but we'll see how that goes. We gotta see how the class is gonna run. I know, I hear this. I know, right? Like this, this is, it's all has to do with CMS and how things are lining up. So this just happened to be a couple like lighter topics all in this one section. So um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I don't wanna make any promises by any means, but uh, I just wanna see if there's any questions there. Okay, uh, asking for a friend, always a good way to deflect. Um, what if you're popping a pill out of the pack and it falls on the floor and you can't find it, so you skip a dose and now you don't have enough pills to take two pills the next day? Interesting. Interesting. So you can't find the pill at all. What if you have like animals or like kids that might find it? Anyway, um, what I would probably recommend is just continuing. I would probably still take the, the two pills there. You, you know you're gonna be a pill short. Um, that's okay, We, you know, especially from a pharmaceutical pharmacy standpoint, we will give you a little bit of leeway in terms of refill. So it'd be okay if you went ahead and you know uh, refill that say a day early. That's not gonna be a problem there. So I don't, I don't think it's gonna make, it, make or break anyone. But you'll probably get questions like that when you're working. You'll have people call you up or maybe your family members will ask questions like this. Like, you know, you're like your first semester of PA school and you go back home and everyone's like, hey, I got this med or I got this growth on my back. What is this thing? I had the same thing in pharmacy school where like I'd go to like Thanksgiving and they'd be like, hey, I got all these meds here. What do they do? And I'm just like, I'm in the first year. Like, I don't know drugs at all. Like we just, I can't even say these things. But anyway, um, yeah, so I would just probably just kind of double up and just know you're gonna be a pill short and just go ahead and start the next pack maybe a day early or something. So. Well, what if you have the triple one where you go up to the three, triple phase? Hmm? Like the triphasic? I would say that 
overall the hormonal exposure is unlikely to be uh, a big concern. I, don't, I wouldn't be too concerned about starting that, that next phase a day early. I don't think it'll make a big, much of a difference, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so let's talk about nephrology for a bit. So I'm going to talk, um, kind of break this up in a few different sections here. Um, we talk about acute kidney injury. Um, this one's not going to be necessarily, there's not a ton about uh, in terms of like management for acute kidney, kidney injury, but I want to talk about the different types, how medications are going to be playing a role here um, and ways we can hopefully avoid this because um, where do you think a lot of patients develop acute kidney injury? In the hospital in a lot of cases there and so we are frequently the ones that are causing uh, these patients uh, to develop acute kidney injury so we're looking at some ways to avoid it some ways to manage it once it does occur sometimes it's unavoidable sometimes you just have to use medications that we know are nephrotoxic um, but again you're weighing your risk versus your benefits um, that cost the patient overall you know, their demise versus having some kidney dysfunction like you typically go with the kidney dysfunction in those cases there but um, what do you call it when we give somebody a new disease state while they're in the hospital yeah, so a lot of this is going to be iatrogenic sort of uh, acute kidney injury. But we'll look at that. We'll get then get into the chronic kidney disease um, and how we're going to manage that. That's going to be a little bit more like traditional, like heavy med focused in terms of like new medications and how we manage those patients there. Um, but this one's going to be more kind of focusing on kind of the drug aspects of things. We'll talk about some other ones as well. And then we'll get into some like homeo, um, uh, sodium management, fluids, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, so how can we tell if a patient's having acute kidney injury? Hmm? What kind of labs? What the B1 would go likely up, right? Thankfully, no one said bun. This is a safe place. You can say bun if you want, but don't say it outside of these four walls. Um, what else would you see? Some creatinine would probably go up. Absolutely. What are some other kind of like obvious things? Your output is going to be another thing that will take a big hit, right? So um, these are common things we're going to look at. Obviously, your analysis can also tell us uh, a lot of things as well. I'm not going to get so in depth on that, but um, certainly. Things like buin, creatinine, urine output, those are kind of the three most common things we're looking at to determine sort of kind of what a patient's current kidney function is. And again, you always want to take it in context for like, what was the patient doing before this? Do we have prior visits where they had previous labs done? How does it compare to now? Um, that's always very handy there. The reason why we care about this so much is mainly because of the fact there's a lot of morbidity and mortality associated with this, right? And again, if you have a sick patient up in the ICU and their kidney function is, is vacillating from day to day, this is important because many of the medications may need to be adjusted similarly day to day and if you don't watch for that you can cause further kidney injury in some cases so it's it's really important you kind of keep an eye on this stuff and frequently it's a thing that goes unnoticed especially if you're like on a busy med surge floor um, or if they're like in a nursing home these are things people just don't watch especially over time um, recognition and prevention is going to be key here because there's not really a good way to reverse this stuff unfortunately there's some rare instances where that's possible but for the most part we can't really reverse the damage once it's done so our goals for these patients here is one, you want to monitor their hemodynamic status because certainly you can find um, if they're volume depleted or volume overloaded, it can have issues in terms of like blood pressure and whatnot. Um, we want to minimize our nephrotoxins, right? So anything that we're giving them that could be nephrotoxic. Do you guys know of any drugs that could be nephrotoxic? What drugs might be nephrotoxic? Vancomycin could have some nephrotoxicity. Aminoglycosides are a big one about if I had like uh, herpes encephalitis. It's likely very concerned to be nephrotoxic. How about um, if I had rheumatoid arthritis? Methotrexate can be nephrotoxic. We have a lot of medications, right? So, uh, and again, when you go out there and you're working, you're not gonna know every single one of them, but you're gonna get familiar with the drugs you're working with and, and have a good idea. Um, how about things like NSAIDs and ACE inhibitors? Can those be nephrotoxic? potentially right the mechanism is different but we'll talk about that we'll talk about the different mechanisms for how they cause their injury in order to help minimize that if we can or, or prevent it as a case may be um, so obviously we want to look at things like blood pressure management we look at fluid balance and obviously the electrolytes are also another big thing uh, that would help them manage so things like their potassium their magnesium their their sodium these are all big things you want to keep an eye on and watch for these patients with acute kidney injury typically if you have someone who has the acute kidney failure what do you think would happen to like say for instance their potassium go up or down typically goes up in a lot of cases there right so then you have to think about hyperkalemia we'll talk about how we manage that in the er section coming up a little bit later on but again there's gonna be a lot of different issues here ultimately what can we do if a patient's kidneys are just not functioning at all yeah, we'll talk about dialysis measures as well um, is it easy to get dialysis running 
yeah, frequently have to get a dialysis catheter uh, put into the patient. Um, depending on where you're working at, the time of day it is, it can be very difficult to get that started or it could be pretty easy. Um, so for instance, like when I was in the fellowship and we have patients that we would recommend dialysis um, due to uh, certain poisonings, things like lithium or aspirin, different things like that. If you're in a big teaching hospital, it's easy because you have nephrology residents that are always on call. They can come in and just get it started, no problem. Um, if you're working in the middle of Podunk nowhere, and the nephrologist is like, you know, a couple hours away and it's Sunday night. Do you think they're going to want to come in? No. And that was a frequently a, a pretty difficult conversation to have, trying to argue that, hey, you, you do need to come in. This patient is sick enough to require this. So, um, again, we, if we can hold off and not need dialysis, that, that'll also be a big benefit. So there's different criteria you can look at. I'm just going to mention a few here. Um, but, again, you're looking at things like their GFR, which, again, what do we use as a surrogate for their GFR? The creatinine clearance, right? So again, we use their serum creatinine into that calculation, whether we're doing like Cockroft Galt or something like that to um, get a surrogate for what their actual GFR is. Um, and we're looking at the urine output. And again, the numbers may change a little bit, but you can see sort of the, the thresholds here. And you're kind of looking at kind of what the patient's baseline is versus what it is now. So if a patient um, normally has, say, a creatinine clearance, so what's like normal creatinine clearance? Usually like over 100 is usually pretty good. 80 to 100 and above is, is usually pretty fine. We don't start to consider a, do, a dose adjusting drugs usually until they get down to like the 60, 50 sort of range there. Uh, it's mLs per minute, right? And so um, looking at that, you know, if a patient is coming in and their initial creatinine clearance is 100 and it say drops to say 80 or 70, that is a big difference, but it may not be as big of a difference as if a patient comes in with a, say, a creatinine clearance of 60 and it goes down to 30, right? So again, the thresholds there may be a little bit different depending on what their kind of baseline is. And that's why they look at like 1.5 times or two times, things like that. Uh, and then certainly urine output's another big one we'll look at. What's a normal urine output for an adult? Usually 0.5 to 1 mLs per kilo per hour. Anything above that's fine as well. That's uh, so when you get below that is when you get start to get concerned about them having oliguric or aneuric. Um, how about for kids? Yeah, one and above is, is good for them, but you can find certainly, you know, they can go up to five, six, seven, eight in some cases, especially like neonates when they're first born and they're diuresing a lot of that extra fluid off, they can have very high urine output. So um, some of that may not be you know, it'll certainly change it from day to day in some cases. Um, when you have complete loss of function, that's when you're gonna require things like renal replacement therapy. So if you see RRT, that's what I'm referring to there. That's using modalities like dialysis to come in uh, and help to replace that function for the kidneys there. So here's another one, just to give you an example of what that looks like. You know, here's the akin criteria. Um, they actually have specific numbers in terms of like increases, absolute increases in serum creatinine, what that might indicate in terms of the, the degree of failure you're seeing for those patients there. So um, just to give you an idea of the different types here. And so I think this is important to, to focus on because, again, the medications are playing a big role here in terms of um, causing kidney injury. And that's what I'm going to more focus on because this is our farm class. Um, but looking at the different types here. So, for instance, you know, community acquired is not super common for the most part, but you'll find that I'm going to be more focusing on the hospital and the ICU acquired because that's, again, where we can have the biggest impact and frequently or we're the ones actually causing it in, in those cases there. Um, and especially like in the ICU when they're on multiple medications or on a bunch of vasopressors. I say vasopressor, what does that mean? Vasopressors, I'm pressing on the vessels, right? Increasing blood pressure, right? So you guys know any vasopressors? Epinephrine's a good one. What else? Vasopressin could be a good one. About dopamine. We'll talk about phenylephrine, norepinephrine. We'll talk about those a little bit later on, but those are vasopressors. And we'll find um, that when you're using multiples of those, you have antibiotics that are nephrotoxic. You can find by combining all these drugs together, there's no wonder why you have such a high incidence of iatrogenic acute kidney injury for these patients here. Um, not only that, if you think about a patient who is septic and they're hypotensive, um, primarily, where does the body want to pump blood to? Is it going to pump blood, say, to the GI tract? No, we don't really care about digesting a whole lot. Um, are the kidneys going to take a backseat a little bit? Absolutely they will, right? Because the two primary organs to keep us alive are the heart and the head, right? So again, you'll find that the kidneys will take a backseat. They'll have de uh, decreased filtration, and that again can lead to a lot of that kidney injury. Because even though the kidneys are quite small, they do require a lot of oxygen in order to keep functioning. So that's where we can see a lot of that interstitial damage um, being done over time. So a lot of different issues here. Um, frequently we'll talk about things like dehydration and, and volume status, and we'll talk about fluids and how we can help to replete that. But that's a frequent um, cause for acute kidney injury as well, is just due to the tank being empty, so to speak, right? So we'll talk about intravascular volume as well. So um, 
when looking at how we're going to manage this, it's important to consider what type of acute kidney injury you're getting here. Have you talked about this much with Dr. O yet? No, Haven't started yet. Fantastic. This will be a good <laughs> precursor, a good uh, prelude to your talk on nephrology. And she'll again come in and say, like, no, no, that's all wrong. Here's the right stuff. <laughs> it's good to get the first uh, the first impression on you guys. Keep the wrong one. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so it's important to delineate the different types of acute kidney injury in terms of like where the actual issue is. And so we're gonna focus on pre-renal issues, intrinsic issues, or post-renal. Um, we'll probably find that far and away that the most common ones are either gonna be pre-renal or intrinsic kidney injuries. Post-renal is less common. We'll look at a few instances of where that can occur. Um, typically, pre-renal issues are gonna have to do with say decreased perfusion of the kidney itself. And this may not actually have damage done to the kidneys yet, um, but you'll find that depending on how long standing it is, how long we're going without perfusing the kidneys, that uh, will eventually lead into some of the intrinsic damage that can occur here. Um, frequently, when you think about medications causing kidney injury, this is where we're gonna get into the intrinsic types or the actual cells of the kidneys themselves are being damaged either in the tubules or maybe more some more interstitial damage being done here. Um, so either toxic insult, which I'm talking about the medications here, or it could be more of an ischemic issue, maybe due to prolonged pre-renal um, you know, decreased filtration or decreased perfusion. Post-renal is typically going to be more of an obstructive kind of case there. Either you have something uh, precipitating out and say like the urethra blocking up uh, flow or maybe you have like the prostate closing down the urethra or things like that. It can be uh, basically anything after the kidneys are causing a decrease in flow. So we'll look at some different um, cases there, how the different medications are going to be working. And again, just a pictorial example, anything before the kidneys, before the glomerulus is going to be considered a pre-renal sort of issue here. Um, anything with the actual the actual functioning par uh, por portions of the kidney itself is going to be considered more intrinsic. It can be glomerular, it can be tubular, interstitial, it can be a lot of different varieties. And then anything afterwards would be considered post renal, right? So, for instance, if you had, say, methotrexate, what's the concern with methotrexate and kidney injury? Yeah, we worry about precipitation of the drug itself. So as you might imagine, um, if you have, say, a patient with, say, low blood volume and maybe um, they're a little bit more on the acidic side of things, you know, the, the urine's on the more acidic side, you can find the drug will actually precipitate out. And so if that happens here in the actual tubules themselves, that can cause direct cellular injury, and that would be more of an intrinsic issue. But what would happen if it, say, was afterwards and it precipitated out and causing a blockage, say, in the ureter? Well, then it's more of a post-renal issue. So it can depend on kind of where it's happening in terms of how we're going to classify that. But you may find the same drug may cause issues at different stages, as the case may be. So, and again, there's a lot of different um, reasons why these things may happen. Certainly, when you're uh, assessing a patient for acute kidney injury, you're going to do a lot of <coughs> laboratory analysis. You're going to look at things like their UAs. You're going to look at all kinds of things here. Um, when you're looking at things like pre-renal acute kidney injury, it's good to kind of have an idea in terms of your differential of what these things, uh, what could be causing this. So frequently it's going to be related to low blood volumes, related to dehydration, you know, uh, if they're bleeding, things like that. Um, but certainly what do you think kind of drugs could cause, say, a pre-renal sort of issue for these patients causing low blood volume? Maybe like what causes you to lose a lot of fluid? diuretics, right? So diuretics would be a big cause for that. So you're just peeing out a lot of extra fluid, intravascular volume is now de uh, decreased, and such you're not going to be perfusing the kidneys as much, right? Um, what about any medications that cause a lot of, say, dehydration in terms of like nausea vomiting? You know, like chemotherapy, right? Uh, highly emetogenic drugs we're giving there. So again, it could be a lot of different things um, you're thinking about from that standpoint. If you're working in like trauma, you'll see that a lot of patients are either bleeding or if you have burns and things like that, certainly can lead to a lot of pre-renal issues there. How do you think we treat that? Give them fluids, right? That's actually one of the easiest ways we can actually help them manage that. So that's gonna be a big one we'll talk about. We'll talk about different fluid types in a little bit. Um, we'll talk about functional uh, pre-renal acute kidney injury, and this is where we're gonna get into things like our NSAIDs and our ACE inhibitors. And so it's important to understand how those are affecting the glomerulus. We'll talk about, again, our favorite efferent and afferent arterioles. Everyone remember all that? Good, we'll talk about that again, causing a pre-renal sort of issue. Um, when you get into the actual intrinsic issue uh, damage here, I'm gonna kind of lump all these together in terms of I'm not gonna get, delineate between like, you know, which drugs cause which specific type, but this is where you get into a lot of our nephrotoxic medications like the aminoglycosides, um, getting into things like your contrast agents and different things like that, causing more of the intrinsic injury. This is one of those things where you want to prevent it as best you can because there's no real easy way to fix that. Once it's caused and it's happened and that's, you're kind of done, you're just kind of um, working on salvage at, at that point. The post-renal 
you're going to see is going to be less common, especially from a drug-related standpoint. But let's say what would happen, and we haven't talked about this in, in urology yet, but if a patient, say, is, for instance, taking exogenous testosterone, uh, what does that do to the prostate? Anyone know? It increases in size, and if that actually causes them to have BPH now or causes an obstruction on the urethra, that's a form of post-renal uh, kidney injury potentially, right? So different ways this can occur, different mechanisms. Um, anticholinergics, why would that cause a post-renal issue? Urinary retention, right? Because you're inhibiting urination because you're holding on to all that extra urine that can cause a backflow sort of issue. So um, again, different, a lot of different options and, and things you may not think about unless you're kind of going through that mechanism thing. Okay, that does make a bit of sense. So um, looking at the community acquired acute kidney injuries, most frequently, this is due to second, uh, secondary to uh, renal hypoperfusion. So you see this a lot with like volume depletion. Um, sepsis is, a, is a, another common one. And it could be related to medications, right? So things like your diuretics or ACE inhibitors, <coughs> maybe NSAIDs. These are typically patients that have um, maybe some longstanding kidney injury or maybe sort of a new thing, especially with the volume depletion. Um, so say, for instance, like you're working in, oh, I remember this one case when I was on rotations, um, you know, working in Florida in the summertime, people want to go to, um, you know, they want to get in shape, they want to get their beach bods on, right? Um, and so they go to these boot camps, right? And so you have people that are uh, physically untrained going to these boot camps where they're uh, exercising very strenuously outside where it's hot, and guess what? They get super dehydrated. And we actually had some patients that were coming in um, seizing because their sodium was all off balance um, related to a lot of the sweating and, and all that and the volume depletion. So um, a lot of issues with that you'll see. And again, we'll talk about fluid management, how we can actually treat that. Typically, with hospital and ICU acquired acute kidney injury, that's more of the interstitial damage. Things like acute tubular necrosis tend to be pretty common because of the medications that we're using tend to be nephrotoxic um, in, in some cases, we'll see. So um, what do you think are some risk factors associated with developing acute kidney injury? Age is a big one, right? So we can't turn back time, so we'll see that some of these are non-modifiable. Some of them are gonna be modifiable, so certainly age is a big one. What else? Medications that they're on previously, right, or on currently, could be an important thing, right? And the, is that modifiable? Yeah, certainly. We can take them off medications. We can change the dose. We can do things like that. A um, lot of different things here. Certainly, patients uh, with African American uh, uh, ancestry tend to be also at risk. They also have um, uh, issues in terms of chronic kidney disease being pretty common. Acute kidney injury oftentimes precedes that. Um, issues of Concomitant disease states like diabetes, right? So again, depending on how where your patient's at in terms of their starting point, again, we're talking about hitting it even further down from there. So if they already come in with poor kidney function, then just causing even further damage. So um, as I mentioned, with the pre-renal acute kidney injury, this is frequently due to hypoperfusion of the renal uh, parenchyma. They may be may or may not be hypotensive to go along with this. It just depends on how the rest of the body is managing this. Um, Typically, you have this decrease in intravascular volume that could be related to things like burns, could be bleeding, could be diuretic therapy. Um, do people ever like abuse diuretics? Why, why would they do that? Lose weight. I remember I had one friend uh, who wanted to, this is not like you know a friend of mine, no, this is actually a true friend. Um, <laughs> I know it seems weird I'd have any of those, but um, he, uh, was, he had uh, aspirations to be an MMA fighter. And so he wanted to cut weight for a competition. And so he ended up finding a way to get diuretics and so actually was able to cut quite a bit of weight down. But of course, how do you think he felt? He felt super hungover and super crappy because he was like completely dehydrated. And so, you know, they do like the, the fight pictures and whatever. Like he just looked like miserable. Like, I was like, why do you do that? It seems ridiculous. But then, uh, you know, he's able to put some of that fluid back on. But regardless, um, that's a common thing there for in terms of weight management. People may try to abuse that. Um, certainly, when you think about things like, say, body-wide inflammatory issues like sepsis, that can be a big cause for things like hypotension. Remember, if you're hypotensive, you're not going to be perfusing the kidneys as well, and that leads to that same sort of pre-renal sort of issue there. Um, other rare ones can be things like, you know, renal artery occlusion, but that's um, pretty un uncommon in a lot of cases. Um, so how do the kidneys sort of compensate for that? What do you think the kidneys would do as a result of feeling like they're being underperfused? The RAS system is going to be playing a role here, right? So again, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. So the angiotensin two that is going to form, what's that going to do for us? It's going to, what does it do to blood pressure? Try to increase it, right? What does that do to say, if I start to um, increase, say, aldosterone levels, what does that do for me? 
Remember how dostrone is going to hold on to sodium and then by nature of holding on to sodium, you hold on to water, right? Uh, ADH secretion is going to be up. What does that do for us? Holds on to more water, right? So again, you're going to see a lot of different things that are going to be happening here to try to get that volume back up. Angiotensin 2 also, where does it work on the glomerulus? The efferent arterial, right? The one leaving the glomerulus that causes vasoconstriction there, right? What does that do in terms of filtration? It increases that back pressure such that the glomerulus is going to be able to filter more, right? So again, all these different things are happening here. They're going to try to increase the amount of fluid being filtered through the kidneys there, right? So again, these are compensatory responses. The kidneys are pretty good at helping with this, but can it be overwhelmed? Absolutely it can, right? So again, this is where you run into issues uh, where these patients may be at um, uh, you know, really high functioning levels of the RAS system. A lot of ADH being secreted is just not enough in some cases there. So we will find some ways we can kind of help out with that. Um, in terms of the functional types of kidney injury, we mentioned the, in, uh, the ACE inhibitors being a cause there. So if I were to give an ACE inhibitor, we just talked about angiotensin 2 clamping down on that efferent arterial. What happens if I give an ACE inhibitor or an ARB? It'll dilate that, right? So it decreases that, that back pressure. Filtration is going to go down, right? Again, most healthy individuals, not going to be a problem, but if they have long-standing kidney disease, this can be an issue. It's causing an acute decrease in their GFR. Now, how about with NSAIDs? Remember, normally prostaglandins do what? They, they constrict or dilate? They dilate the afferent arterial, the one actually coming into the glomerulus. So if I give it an NSAID, it will cause the prostaglandin synthesis to go down. It'll cause constriction of that afferent arterial, right? So um, you can see there why having a patient with, say, long-standing chronic kidney disease, giving them something like an NSAID when they come into the hospital, how you can cause an acute decrease in function because basically the filtration pressure is not going to be uh, working anymore, right? So basically not having as much fluid coming in. And so this is where you run into a lot of these big issues here, right? Anyway, and then also vasopressor. So if I were to give something like norepinephrine, IV, certainly get my blood pressure up, but what does it do in terms of shunting blood to certain organs? It'll decrease that renal perfusion because again, it's focusing on perfusing the heart and the head. And so again, we can't just say, tell, you know, the norepinephrine just work on getting more fluid to the kidneys. It doesn't work that way, right? So again, it's not gonna, it's kind of working the same as it does when you release our own norepinephrine. So in these cases here, by adding on vasopressors is another common reason why we'll have patients, especially in the ICUs, who will have an acute kidney injury, especially on top of the other meds that we're giving potentially. The nice thing with this is that pre-renal acute kidney injuries are typically uh, reversible for the most part. If you can find the cause for it and either fix it by either giving more fluids or discontinuing the offending agent, you can typically get function back, no problem. It's only when that this kind of prolonged pre-renal issue that this can lead to actual parenchymal damage because basically you're causing hypoxia, you're causing damage to the cells there. So that's the, the big issue is you want to find it and treat it early in order to make sure you don't have any kind of long-standing issues you have to deal with down the road, okay? So um, let's go into a 10 minute break. We'll come back and then start talking about intrinsic kidney injury. I know you guys are probably like, why is he talking so much about this kidney stuff? Like, why is it so important? <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, the kidneys are important, right? But like, why do you think I focus so much on it? Like on trying to like prevent this from happening like in the hospital? Yeah, like, so <laughs> what'd you say? <laughs> Plot twist. <laughs> yeah. um, it's important because like, imagine you have a patient comes in for sepsis and you're treating them for that, right? And so you're getting paid for treatment of sepsis, but you cause an acute kidney injury on top of that. Do the insurance companies want to pay you for that? They do not, right? So again, this is a big reason why you see a lot of high hospital costs associated with some of the iatrogenic stuff we do because of the fact that we're not getting paid for it back, right? So um, this is why we do a lot of things to try to prevent it from occurring, that like we have certain monitoring systems. So for instance, we have um, something over at Nemours. We, and, and you know, I love it when people like come up with like they try to fit acronyms to, uh, you know, just get a good name for something, but they have a system called Ninja that we use um, for monitoring for kidney injury in, in some of our pediatric patients. So basically, um, I don't remember what the acronym stands for, I just know it's the Ninja thing. So um, like our nephrologists actually go through and they get a patient list every day and they go through and see, okay, which nephrotoxic medications are patients on, uh, which ones can we get rid of, which ones can we change, things like that, because it is so important to prevent this from occurring in the first place, right? So when I'm saying this is important, I'm not kidding in around. <laughs> Waiting all day for that one, so. Anyway, so we talked about the pre-renal <laughs> issues there, getting into more of the intrinsic. Certainly damage can happen really anywhere, either to the vasculature or the glomeruli. Um, you're gonna find that the actual um, 
acute tubular necrosis is going to be more of the common one they're going to run into in terms of medications there. And certainly there's a lot of different types that can occur. I'm not going to get into um, the kind of nitty gritty on each specific subtype, but we'll talk about, you know, different ways that medications can affect these. So, um, you know, looking at the actual renal vasculature, you know, certainly you can have things like um, actual like, emboli that can occur here. You know, we think about things like um, one of the things I think about, especially when I think about kidney injury as related to like illicit substances. Um, there's a, one case, is, uh, several cases that happened a couple years back when the, the bath salts were kind of coming around. You guys are familiar? We talked, we kind of mentioned them before. They're sort of amphetamine-like products. And so if you had to imagine patients who were taking, say, larger doses of these amphetamine-like products, um, what do you think it does in terms of, say, like their temperature? usually get pretty hot, they get hyperthermic, right? So there's having some cases like their temperature getting up like 107 degrees Fahrenheit, things like that. Um, what do you think can happen, say like to the muscles? They get hot, they can get overstimulated. Uh, they can develop rhabdomyolysis, which is a common thing you may see in, in, in that, with that particular type of substance. And what happens with the rhabdo is you have all this myoglobin being released out into the into this, the system, and you can actually find that it can precipitate out, and especially in the kidneys, either in the tubules, sometimes in the renal vasculature. And so these patients are developing um, rhabdomyolysis, and they were having basically a permanent kidney injury being done based on the fact they're having all this interstitial injury happening based off the, the fact that all that myoglobin was, was being released and precipitating out, as it were. And so, again, I think about these things in terms of like you know uncommon causes for this or interesting causes for it that could be one like designer drugs could be a potential thing here um, that you may see but anyway so again it can really occur anywhere um, certainly when you're thinking about this intrinsic injury um, from a renal vascular standpoint you also want to think about things like your hypertensive patients your diabetic patients who are kind of chronically sort of um, damaging the, the vasculature over time that's where you can kind of see that progressive sort of um, decline in terms of their kidney injury which puts them at bigger risk for having an acute event on top of their chronic issues um, we don't see a lot on glomerular damage done from a medication standpoint but a lot of it is more related to the actual tubular damage that happens here so uh, about 85% of the intrinsic kidney injury here is going to be acute tubular necrosis. So I'll kind of focus on that one here. So for instance, I mentioned the, the myoglobin there. Um, when do you think uric acid can be an issue? Maybe patients with gout, right? We talked about you can have nephrolithiasis that can develop that can cause interstitial injury. Um, what about patients with, say, they have leukemia and they have a very high white cell count. We give them chemotherapy for that. What happens to all the cells that they die off? So all those purines and whatnot can be broken down into uric acid. Remember that we talked about tumor lysis syndrome, we mentioned that. Um, that can be another really big cause for causing kidney injury in those patients as well due to that uric acid. Hemoglobin can be another one that can cause that if you're having like uh, hemolysis and you know, things. Um, and this is again where a lot of our medications come into play. They're ones that are directly nephrotoxic. So things like our contrast agents can be uh, causing contrast induced nephropathy. It's through this interstitial damage. Aminoglycosides can cause acute tubular injury to the cells there causing this damage again. So, um, and again, because these portions, the tubules themselves are highly metabolically active, right? They require a lot of oxygen. So anything you're doing to either cause damage to the cells or preventing oxygen from getting there is gonna cause this damage to occur, right? A lot of, um, very quickly, uh, hypoxia can, can set in for those cells there, hypoxic injury. So anyway, so as we mentioned, so if you're having an ischemic sort of injury done to the cells here, this is where you can develop necrosis and apoptosis of the cells there. And what also happens, and in, in what's interesting, is even if their urine output doesn't actually change a whole lot, you can actually find that their ability to sort of regulate um, what gets reabsorbed and what gets secreted can certainly be affected. And so um, I had this one preceptor who talked about having dumb kidneys, where basically it looks like the urine output is okay, but it can't regulate things like uh, reabsorbing things like bicarbonate or uh, glucose or potassium and things like that. And so you'd find you'd just be excreting a lot of these contents out through the urine when they should have been reabsorbed potentially. Um, so again, regulation is going to be a big issue there. It's also where you can have things like, you know, cast start to, to develop as that cellular debris starts to kind of break off. And you can see that on, on the UA potentially. Um, and again, depending on the inciting event, it could happen over hours to days, and ideally you'd like to prevent it if you can, but once it's already happened, it's, you're kind of dealing with that injury. You can't do anything to really reverse it at that point there. But things you'll see will be things like reduced GFR. You'll see decrease urine output, and certainly on the UA, you can see um, different changes in there, things like specific gravity and things like that. They'll be indicative of the fact they're not concentrating the urine very well. So, um, 
Other things in terms of interstitial damage may be related to medications, not as commonly, but this is where you can get a lot of like inter autoimmune diseases that can cause issues here. Um, so you think about things like you know lupus, nephritis, and things like that can can develop some interstitial damage here. Um, again, most of the time we're not going to do a whole lot to manage that. If you can obviously recognize it's a big thing. If it's an autoimmune issue, how do you think we treat that? Lots of steroids, right? You know, again, if it's things like lupus is kind of flaring up, causing some nephritis, you can give steroids, right? You can help deal with that inflammation. Um, so sometimes there may be an easy way to reverse it, but uh, it just depends on, on the, the reason why it's happening. So then lastly, focusing on the post-renal issues, um, causing acute kidney injury, this is rare. It's not super likely you're gonna see this as a result of medication specifically, but it's mainly gonna be due to Things like you know bladder outlet obstruction, or could be related like BPH, could be related to anticholinergics causing urinary retention. Um, you can even sometimes see things that like oxalate crystal deposition due to medications in some cases can actually cause an obstructive sort of issue there. Um, from a toxicology standpoint, I think about things like radiator fluid ingestions actually produces a lot of um, calcium oxalate crystals that can actually cause acute kidney injury as well. So uh, a lot of it may be either related to interstitial damage or related to some of those post renal issues as well. And, and again, drugs with that poor solubility, things like methotrexate trexate um, tend to be um, uh, frequent offenders in terms of causing a post renal issue as well uh, acyclovir things like that and what do we what do we give with methotrexate to try to prevent that precipitation from occurring you remember remember solubility a lot frequently has to do with the pH right so if the urine is too acidic then you can get that precipitation occurring versus if I try to increase the pH by giving sodium bicarb, I can actually bump that up and that actually helps to uh, keep it soluble, help to allow for the patient to, to pee it out, right? Um, so that can be one way we can try to modify these things based off of how well we're either alkalizing or acidifying the urine potentially. Usually I mentioned that chemotherapy induced tumor lysis syndrome, that's also another really big one we, we're concerned about, especially when you have patients with really high white counts or getting chemo for the first time. So how these patients present, typically it'll be changes in urinary habits, maybe they're not peeing as much, maybe the uh, characteristics of the urine have changed. So for instance, like, uh, I don't know if you guys are ever on the interwebs ever, um, but there are you know, certain websites where like, especially around January-ish timeframe, where a lot of people like you know, certain fitness websites, so people little post um, like, hey, I just started hitting the gym again really hard, uh, and my urine now looks like this, and it show a picture and it looks like cola. And everyone's like, you need to go to the hospital right now, because they're probably developing or have developed rhabdomyolysis. And they said, nah, I don't really have any insurance. I'm good, I'm just gonna drink a bunch of water. And they're like, no, 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 you need to go right now. And then sure enough, like, you know, 12 hours later, like, yeah, I went to the ER and they said, I almost lost all my kidney function. And, but so anyway, so things like that you can potentially notice. Again, you always wanna let patients know if you're gonna give them a medication that changes the color of the urine to warn them about that because it could cause quite a bit of an alarm for them. They may wanna go to the ER because they said, my, my urine's orange now, like, but nothing that's normal. So what kind of drugs could do that? FAM is a big one, what else? How about they have like a UTI? You remember, uh, ever heard of a drug called Azo? It's an over-the-counter drug, it's phenazopyridine is, is uh, the name of it. You can actually turn your urine kind of orangish, reddish kind of color too. Um, you know, so things like that. How about anything that turns your urine green? Right, that's gonna be more of an in-hospital thing, so it's not like your patients would notice that on the outpatient side, but, and ideally if they're getting propofol, they're gonna be asleep anyway, so they're not really gonna notice that. But um, anyway, so things like that, changes in urine color. Did I ever tell you about how I gave a patient purple urine one time? Was it with that drug Azo? Enough of you have a blank stare on your face that either are not listening or you don't remember the story. So I'll tell it anyway for those that don't remember. Um, but I had a patient actually had overdosed on Azo, a phenazopyridine, uh, one time. And so she ended up having, she had, uh, ended up being, I wish she was intubated or not, but she had a Foley in. So we could see the urine coming out into the Foley bag. Um, and so we, um, she had very bright orange urine that was coming out as a result of the Azo that she had taken. Well, one of the things you can see as a result of um, Azo is the fact that it's a strong oxidizer. It actually caused a methemoglobin met hemoglobinemia in the patient, right? So the um, patient had a pretty dark complexion, so she didn't really look blue, but certainly the met hemoglobin levels were pretty elevated. Um, and so you guys remember what, what you get for met hemoglobinemia? You methylene blue, right? You give a blue drug to a blue patient, you turn them pink again. So we gave that, but anyone know what methylene blue turns your urine color to? Turns it blue. So now we have blue and red actually mixing together. So you can see after we gave the methylene blue, you actually see the urine coming out turning purple. It was pretty cool seeing that kind of happen like in real time, how quickly it was getting filtered through the kidneys there. So anyway, again, 
not for recreational purposes, for turning urine random colors, but that was kind of an interesting one there to see the two kind of combine. But um, other things you'll find, things like weight gain can occur here due to mainly fluid retention, uh, may complain of flank pain. It's important to also consider, is this more of an acute issue that's kind of newly being found? Is it a chronic issue that's been happening for a while, or is it more of an acute on chronic? So they have long standing kidney disease, but they have an acute issue that has now caused it. So for instance, we see this a lot in patients who are, uh, for instance, at a nursing home, maybe they're not being watched very well, maybe they get sick, they get a cold or something. Uh, they're not getting good PO intake of fluids, and that causes an acute pre-renal sort of kidney um, uh, state that they're in there in such that their medications now are not being filtered very well and they can hold on to that leading to a lot of toxicity. So I've seen several cases of things like um, uh, theophylline toxicity as a result of that. They didn't get good PO intake, acute decrease in renal function, and they held on to all that drug causing things like seizures to occur. So I kind of want to figure out if it's more of an acute or chronic or acute on chronic sort of situation there. Um, typically, it's easier to determine if you're inpatient. Why do you think that is? Yeah, you kind of know everything that's happening with the patient there. You have good documentation of stuff happening um, versus on the outpatient side, you may be reliant on the patient's memory. Uh, they may not have any caregivers to give you history, things like that. So it's a little bit more difficult to determine there. Um, certainly get a history, especially in terms of the medications that they're on, that they're currently taking. Um, look at things like previous lab studies. If they're staying within the same hospital system, it's nice because you have access to previous labs, but kind of figure out what their baseline normally is and kind of where they're at now is, is important there. Um, certainly consider things like over-the-counter drugs, think about herbal supplements, think about recreational drugs that could all be affecting this, right? So I mentioned things like the bath salts or other amphetamine-like compounds causing rhabdomyolysis leading to kidney injury. So you want to know about that sort of thing. Are patients frequently very truthful about recreational drug use? Frequently no, right? So um, sometimes you can do some lab testing to help out with that, but it's not always gonna be super useful there. And again, you wanna trend the laboratory data to see where they're going, not just use a single point in time to make all your decisions. So um, we use serum creatinine pretty frequently to help us determine the patient's kidney function, right? Um, there are limitations to that though, right? Because serum creatinine comes from where? I'm sure, yeah, it's a metabolic byproduct of muscle breakdown, normal muscle breakdown that occurs, right? So creatine get turned into creatinine. Um, so who might not produce a lot of that? They have maybe low muscle mass, right? Maybe an infant would not produce a whole lot. Who else might not have as much? Elderly patients, good, who else? Yeah, they have, if they're an amputee, maybe they have diabetes. And you know diabetic patients are gonna have issues of chronic kidney disease. Maybe they had an amputation because they had an infected wound that was not being cared for properly, so they just went ahead and took the limb off. Um, it's important to understand that a patient's creatinine may not be always really the, the best indicator of kind of what's going on in terms of kidney function there. So you wanna be cautious with that. Uh, how about things like dehydration? How would that affect it? Yeah, artificial increase because it's concentrated, right? More so such that it'll look higher than what it would be if maybe the patient had, say, a couple liters of IV fluids administered to them. And so you want to be cautious of that. You kind of want to get a good idea of, of kind of what the patient's status is in terms of making decisions. So as a good example of this, um, with our CF patients, when they come in uh, for a pulmonary exacerbation frequently, um, they don't have good PO intake for the kind of preceding couple of days, such that they tend to be dehydrated, uh, and that leads that their creatinine actually is falsely elevated. So even though CF patients, do they typically have kidney problems? No, they don't. So even though it looks like their creatinine is elevated, it looks like they have an acute kidney process going on, it's actually not, they're just dehydrated. So typically when we're dosing the medications there, we'll actually wait until we give them a couple liters of fluid and then go back and check another creatinine and typically it's gone down back to where their normal baseline levels are and dose based off of that. Um, so again, it's important to consider what the, the, the situation is from that standpoint. Because again, if I'm dosing based off of a, an erroneous uh, creatinine level, I may be either too aggressive with how much I'm giving or I may not be giving enough. And that's really important. Think about like a CF patient. If I underestimated their creatinine clearance and I was underdosing them, what can happen? Antibiotics. You're going to see resistance. I'm not treating that infection in the first place. And again, those pulmonary infections are really hard to treat anyway because all that mucus I have there is just sitting there with all that pseudomonas growing, right? So be cautious. Make sure you're, you're knowing which calculation that you're using. For most adult patients, you use Cockroft Gall, but that's not going to be appropriate, say, for instance, like for kids. So um, th things like that you want to know whether you're going to be under or overestimating a patient's GFR. Also, you're going to find that just like anything else, just like drugs, you know, everything has a half-life. 
in, this, in the body. And so creatinine is no different from that standpoint. So it can be actually be a lagging indicator of actual kidney injury that's occurring there because it takes a while for it to get to a new steady state. So it could be a day or two before you really notice any big changes there. And so if you imagine here looking at this picture, you can see the patient's GFR versus serum creatinine. Um, here looking at the changes, you can see after the insult, say, hey, kidneys, you're not filtering very well. I think it's, it's feelings hurt because it was insulted. I'm just kidding. Oh, but I say, for instance, you know, they have uh, some kind of acute process there causing an acute decrease in GFR. They're definitely not filtering as well anymore, but it takes a while for that creatinine to actually equilibrate out to its new steady state level. And so because of that, it may be a couple of days before you notice that. So what could I look for earlier that would maybe indicate that something's going on? Yeah, typically your output is going to be a pretty good indicator there. So I can kind of use these two in conjunction. It's like, okay, well, I noticed there's an acute decrease in urine output. Creatinine still looks okay, but then you're going to be trending that. You'll see that we'll catch up eventually as you get to that point. You know, people are looking for other markers that could help us identify this stuff earlier, but again, there's nothing really definitive yet. So uh, if you can predict it, that's always going to be best because then you can try to help mitigate it and try to avoid it in the first place. So for instance, if you know a patient has to go and get contrast for an imaging procedure, if you can try to really aggressively hydrate them beforehand, that can be really beneficial, right? Um, is that always going to be possible? Typically, no, right? So especially if you have a patient who comes into the ER complaining of chest pain, um, you know, you need, want to roll out a PE or a CT scan, you may not have that, that ability to wait um, for them to get um, well hydrated beforehand. You may want to scan them before that point. So again, if you can predict it, that's always, always going to be beneficial. Um, adequate fluid intake for most adults is usually between two and three liters a day. So you want to kind of see where they're at in terms of their current intake, which may be pretty significantly diminished depending on what's going on. Um, and we can try to help replace that if we can. So when we talk about maintenance fluids, that's what we're talking about is trying to help replace um, that two to three liters a day that they should be getting. If we can, try to avoid nephrotoxic meds. So if you can avoid, uh, and for instance, if you're thinking about like um, contrast-induced nephropathy, what's the big medication you're really worried about the patient being on? Things like metformin, right? So make sure patients are off of the metformin before they get the contrast. Make sure you don't have any accumulation of lactic acid causing injury that way, right? Um, and then make sure you're identifying and screening patients that are at risk, you know, either patients already have existing chronic kidney disease, things like that. Uh, and then monitor, monitor until that risk is sort of subsided there. So for instance, if they got contrast, you know, eventually the contrast will be out of the system. You're not as big a, uh, of a risk at that point, right? So in terms of hydration, this has been really the only thing that really shows consistent benefit in making sure patients um, are, are trying to prevent cases of acute kidney injury in the first place, right? Um, when we're talking about fluids, there's two main varieties. There's the crystalloids and the colloids. Have we talked about this before? Maybe not, I don't, maybe not I, from my perspective, but there's two main varieties, crystalloids and colloids. What's the difference? Crystalloids sounds like an alien species perhaps. They're attacking Earth. No, crystalloids are going to be things that, in, that have salts in them, right? So, think salt crystals and crystalloids. Um, examples include things like normal saline, lactated ringers. What do you think is the most common one, one we end up using? Normal saline, far and away. Where do you use a lot of lactated ringers? Usually in surgery, you're going to see a lot more um, lactated ringers being used. And there's a reason for that, which we can talk about a little bit later on. Um, basically, these are going to be the kind of the gold standard in terms of volume. Um, supplementation uh, for these patients here. So typically, like when you come into the ER, if you're dehydrated, it's one of the first things you might get is going to be a liter of uh, IV saline, for instance. Um, the reason why we like crystalloids is because they're relatively cheap and there's not a whole lot of side effects associated with them, okay? On the other hand, we have things like crystalloids, or I'm sorry, colloids, and these are going to be either things that are like kind of protein-based or starch-based, where they have a little bit different actions there. But um, one of the things you'll find is that they do provide things like oncotic pressure. When I say oncotic pressure, what does that mean? Kind of they hold fluid in a certain place there, right? So for instance, if I had a patient who had low albumin levels in the bloodstream, a lot of that fluid can then just leak out and go into the interstitial spaces, right? They're not holding that fluid there in the, in the actual vessels. And what does that do to your blood pressure? It could go down, for instance, right? So if you have a patient that has hypoalbuminemia, they may have low oncotic pressure, they may have low blood pressure as a result of that, all that fluid leaking out. By giving uh, supplementation of that, giving them a dose of albumin, I can help to draw that water back in and hold it there. So there are some instances where you wanna do that. Typically it's gonna be more expensive and typically you're gonna see there are some risk associated with it. Actually some of them, things like head of starch can actually cause kidney injury in and of themselves. So for the most part, most patients will end up getting IV crystalloids. Occasionally they may get some of these colloids here, right? And again, if you also wanna think about things like, are they bleeding, then you typically wanna give them what? Blood, perhaps, right? So again, if they're bleeding like crazy, 
give them some blood back. So you see that a lot with like trauma patients and whatnot. So why do we consider normal saline normal? Yeah, it has to do with the osmolarity of the substance. It also has to do with the salt content of it, the actual the sodium levels. Um, so we use 0.9% sodium chloride is considered normal saline. So if that stands to reason, what's half normal saline? 0.45, right? And then quarter normal, it's like 0.22. As you may see quarter normal saline being used occasionally. Um, basically what that means is 0.9 grams of sodium chloride for every 100 mL. That's not really the important part, uh, but that's what that 0.9% actually means there. What is important though, that has roughly 154 milliequivalents per liter of sodium. And then to go along with every sodium, there is chloride to go along with it. And so uh, it's gonna be 154 milliequivalents there. Um, so in total, of osmotically active particles, they're going to have roughly 304 or th uh, 308 per liter, right? And what's our normal serum osmolarity? 280 to 300 ish, somewhere around there. And so again, it's going to be isotonic to us, right? If I give, say, quarter normal saline, that's going to be hypotonic, right? And so that's going to be really important in terms of where fluid is going in terms of. The vasculature say is it going to go is it going to stay there in the vessels is it going to leach out and go into the tissues where do you want that fluid to go to and that can be an important deci um, decision on, on how, what we're going to give so anyway um, however though you can have other fluids things like dextrose right we give dextrose all the time uh, if you were to give dextrose five percent which is also isotonic roughly it's 253 milliosms per liter um, that one it does not provide the same sort of um, volume repletion as you'll see with something like normal saline because it's considered to be something called just free water at that point right so what happens to all the dextrose that you give well it gets either shuttled into the cells or it gets metabolized and basically goes out of the bloodstream and so because of all that water still there but there's nothing to hold it there there's no uh, there's no salt in that fluid and so it just all leaks out into the tissues okay so we call that free water and would not be really good if you had a patient who's hypotensive and was intravascularly depleted First, if I get something that's isotonic, if I put it into the, into the blood vessels, guess what? It's all gonna basically stay right there. So that's gonna be better for using, um, uh, for, for volume repletion for these patients here, okay? So think about the oncotic pressures, think about the, the osmolarity and where fluids are gonna go. Um, in Clin Farm, during the summer, I have a whole other lecture that's just basically going through a bunch of fluid cases and whatnot. Um, but basically, this is why we use normal saline, because it is isotonic, and when I give it into the intravascular space, it stays right there for the most part, okay? When would I use hypotonic fluids? Hmm? Yeah, so maybe I want to put more fluid into the cells. Maybe they've been dehydrated for a while. They've been vomiting, diarrhea, something like that uh, for a couple of days. I can actually give hypotonic fluids in some cases to actually allow more of that fluid to filter out into the cells itself. Um, so that's where you may see like D5 half normal saline being given as maintenance fluids. Um, what do you think would be a risk of using half normal saline in patients like that? Because the sodium concentration here is 154 milliequivalents per liter. And what's our normal sodium levels? 135 to 145, right? So by giving this, it's taking pretty close to what our normal serum sodium levels are anyway. If I was giving half normal saline, what would be the concentration of sodium per liter? It's about roughly 77 um, milliequivalents per liter, right? So 77 is a lot lower than 140 on average. So what could you cause? Hyponatremia, right? So that's actually one of the big risks you're gonna find there is that we can cause iatrogenic, or one of the big causes for hyponatremia in the hospitals is because we did it to them because we gave D5 half normal. So we're actually, especially in pediatrics, we're moving a, a lot away from that and just using D5 normal for almost everyone. There are some indications we may wanna use half normal saline, maybe they are hypernatremic. That could be a reason. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on, but these are things I kind of want you to start thinking about in terms of why we do what we do, right? Again, it's easy enough to know, that, okay, everyone gets normal saline, but why do we give that? That's, that's what I wanted to kind of instill into you. So other things people have tried that maybe get less, um, less uh, positive results as opposed to fluids here, um, things like loop diuretics. Now, why do you think loop diuretics might be used for patients with acute kidney injury? I think they're not peeing, then we'll give them something to make them pee, right? And that will work to some degree, right? Even if you have pretty significantly depressed kidney function, um, you know, loop diuretics can still get some benefit. We'll still see some increase in urine outflow. Um, unfortunately, they're going to find that it doesn't really help to prevent acute kidney injury just because they're peeing doesn't mean that they're actually filtering appropriately. doesn't mean you've actually fixed any of the issues there. The other big thing to note and where you want to be careful is that actually loop diuretics, especially in patients with this um, kidney injury, can actually develop ototoxicity, right? 
So especially if you give it other medications that cause ototoxicity. You guys remember any examples? I mean, the glycosides, right? We already talked about how that can cause acute kidney injury in and of itself. You can see how these things start to compound on one another, right? All of a sudden, your patient's intubated, and you can't ask them, how's your hearing doing? Um, can develop this ototoxicity over time, right? Also, loop diuretics could also cause what? Dehydration. So now you're dealing with a pre-renal issue now. So this is, again, the reason why adding on more medications just to make the patient pee is not necessarily going to be all that effective for those patients there. Um, can be useful, though, if you have patients that are fluid overloaded, right? Because, again, um, you know, if you have CHF or something like that, ascites uh, due to the liver failure, this is where giving a loop diuretic may be useful to help get rid of some of that extra fluid off of the, off the system. Uh, people have tried using vasodilators to say, we say, why don't we just kind of try to um, dilate those afferent arterioles to allow more fluid to flow into uh, the kidneys, and that way we will have better filtration to occur. And there's some benefits to that, but you're going to find it's not going to be as consistent as something like just good IV hydration. Um, so this is where we can do things like using dopamine agonists. Basically using a dopamine receptor agonist can actually help to dilate those vessels and allow for better uh, renal flow. And so we have two that we use. Phenoldopam is not gonna be as often, but um, dopamine is one drug you're gonna see used quite frequently, right? Now dopamine is kind of interesting because based on the, the rate that you're giving it, it can actually change how it's working in the system. So um, you'll frequently see this when dealing with um, you know, patients with low blood pressure or maybe they're bradycardic. This is where dopamine comes into play quite frequently. At really low doses, it only works as a dopamine agonist and is able to help to dilate those vessels and offer a little bit better flow in. That's around one to five mics per kilo per minute, relatively low doses. When you start to get above that, you find that dopamine actually will start to activate beta-1 receptors, which can cause what? Where we see a lot of beta-1 receptors. You know, one heart, two lungs, right? So you feel like a lot of beta-1 activation, so that would do what to your heart rate? Increase it, cardiac output would increase, right? So again, that's where we can use it as a um, positive inotrope and chronotrope, okay? Can be used, that's kind of the mid-range dosing. And once you start to get to high doses, then you actually get some alpha-1 activation as well. And what is that going to do for us? What does it do to your pressure? Your blood pressure. Alpha-1 activation causes vaso constriction, so it bumps up your pressure. So you see this being frequently used as either um, something to increase cardiac output, or you may see it used as a vasopressor to actually increase blood pressure. So if you have someone, say for instance, who is in uh, decompensated heart failure and you wanted to increase cardiac output and their blood pressure, this is where dopamine is frequently used, right? So, um, but again, for kidney injury purposes, not gonna be as effective, but we'll talk more about this one when we get into vasopressors a little bit later on. Um, some people even tried using antioxidants. So some of the things that happen when you have hypoxic injury is you can develop things like free radicals that can cause further damage to the, the cells. And so by giving antioxidants, the idea is that you will help to um, mitigate some of that because it'll help to bind up those free radicals and prevent the oxidative injury. Uh, so things like ascorbic acid have been used before. Now, do you think there's any risk with even vitamin C? Not really. So it's one of those things that's kind of low risk, but it also is not going to be very high yield either. Um, so not going to be super effective here, but people have tried it and it kind of goes, you can try it, but probably not going to cause a lot of harm there. Um, what I do see a little bit more frequently is something called N-acetylcysteine, or otherwise known as mucomist. So mucomist is typically the drug we use to treat acetaminophen overdoses, but we also find that it helps as an antioxidant as well. So I've actually had a couple of patients who are really high risk. Um, they had chronic kidney disease. We were really worried about giving them um, contrast because they needed a scan. Uh, and so we'd actually give them mucomist beforehand to help out and, and prevent some of the oxidative injury that the contrast might induce. Um, and again, we don't have good evidence to say whether it works or not, but you, you may see that done occasionally. Um, the reason why it's good as an antioxidant, it has a high sulfur content, but that also imparts to it a nice rotten egg smell. Um, I've actually uh, uh, been um, desensitized to it because I've smelled it so much, like to my fellowship training and whatnot. Um, but I remember when I first, my first uh, day working in a hospital pharmacy, um, you know, we'll frequently use mucomus as well as a mucolytic. So sometimes you see it used to help kind of break up pulmonary congestion. Um, my first day working in a hospital, they say, here, you're going to go make all the mucomus vials. And so I take a big vial of mucomus and separate them out to little tiny aliquots uh, for the RTs to use for their, their nebulizations. And so I said, okay, let's, let's get started. Let's do it. And you know, I was a little go get her and I was gonna do a really good job with this and I opened the thing up and immediately I was like because that rotten egg smell is vile right so again you want to think about these patients having to take this orally it's not great right so that's kind of one of the big downsides to that over time though I got desensitized to it now it just smells like regular eggs <laughs> or the eggs I'm using at home are not great but either way 
They're still edible. Um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting drug. We'll talk more about that when we get into Tylenol poisoning uh, a little bit later on in the semester. Um, so once you actually have the injury itself, obviously we'd like to get rid of whatever was a causative agent. So again, it, um, if you imagine you had a patient receiving an amino glycoside, say for a pseudomonal infection, and it's causing acute kidney injury, what could I switch them out to that may be less nephrotoxic? Maybe a fluoroquinolone, maybe a beta-lactam if they're not already on one. You know, so things like that. You want to think about getting rid of the agent if possible. And again, supportive care is a really big thing. So just looking at fluid status, look at their blood pressure, help them manage that. And this is where renal replacement therapy can also come into play, right? So um, I'll talk a little bit more about dialysis later on, but there's different strategies you can use. There's continuous renal replacement therapy. There's intermittent dialysis, a lot of different modalities that are, are available there. But um, hopefully if you catch it early, you may find that they will have resolution, may have complete recovery, but if it's more long standing, you're more likely to see kind of permanent damage being done. And it's like I mentioned, those patients who are using those kind of designer bath salts uh, products that developed rhabdo and had kidney failure as a result of that, they, a lot of them actually end up on dialysis long term afterwards because they just could not recover any function in and of themselves. So that's really the biggest thing is try to minimize the insult, get rid of any offending agents you can and try to help out with the recovery. So dehydration is going to be another thing that's going to help to exacerbate this. So you want to make sure you're helping to hydrate them as best you can. Um, we've talked about fluid boluses before. A good dose is 20 mils per kilo, right? So you can't go wrong with using that for like adult patients or for pediatric patients. Adults is roughly between one to two liters of normal saline most frequently, maybe lactated ringers if you're in surgery, for instance. Um, but uh, you're going to find that with fluids, you can always give more, but once you put it in, can you get it back out very easily? No, how am I gonna get it out? Either time or like you can use a diuretic or dialysis could pull it off, right? So again, there's not, none of those options are really good. I'm using, um, you know, ideally if I could have just used a smaller dose to begin with, that would have been beneficial. So um, if you have patients who have long-standing kidney disease, if they have CHF, things like that, you may be more cautious and maybe using only say a half liter, maybe 500 mLs. Again, you can always add more fluids on if you need to. Um, some patients may require a, a whole lot more than just a standard one to two liters. So if you have like a septic patient who's having kind of body-wide vasodilation due to this inflammation, um, you may need, you know, three, four uh, liters. You have trauma patients who may need six to eight liters. I mean, you can pump a lot of fluids into these patients here. Um, but again, this is where you can really run into problems, especially like the pediatric patient, you know. Um, say, for instance, you have uh, a kid who's only, say, for instance, um, like six kilos, right? Like six kilos, what would be a fluid bolus for them? 20 times six, 120 mLs, right? So you say 120 mLs, what, what, what would happen if I hang a whole liter on that patient there and someone wasn't watching to see how much was infusing in? Well, there's been cases where the whole liter would basically go in and basically the kid would develop uh, flash pulmonary edema and end up dying from that. So that's why it's really important, especially in pediatrics, to make sure you're using pumps to have um, settings on them so you know specifically how much is, are gonna go into that patient to avoid uh, fluid overloading them. Ideally, what we're going to be shooting for, though, um, is make sure your output is staying roughly above 0.5 mLs per kilo per hour, more than one for children, uh, and then looking at the MAP as well, right? So MAP just stands for mean arterial pressure. Usually your, um, uh, your monitors will tell you that number. Uh, how could you calculate it? Yeah, I usually just use uh, one-third of your systolic plus two-thirds of your diastolic because you're roughly a third of the time in systole and two thirds of the time in diastole. So um, that's a, a pretty rough estimate there. But, but like I said, most of your monitors will, will calculate that for you. And then you're looking for edema, you're looking for fluid overload, any signs of that. And then watching things like their uh, electrolytes on the BMPs, looking at their uh, glucose levels, make sure that's all staying in check. So as I mentioned, smaller volumes may be needed. If they're anuric, oliguric, um, you know, if they have pulmonary insufficiency, CHF, things like that. Um, again, start low and, and you can always give more for those cases there. Some patients, you, uh, by giving large volumes of normal saline, though, you can actually cause a hyperchloremia. Why do you think that would occur? It's a normal chloride level for a patient. Usually like in the low one teens-ish, like one ten-ish sort of area, uh, area milliequivalents per liter. Um, what do we say was the concentration of chloride in normal saline? 
154 milliequivalents per liter. So it stands a reason by giving all the extra chloride, you can actually induce an acidosis. That is some reason why patients may switch over and using something like um, lactated ringers, because actually that lactate gets converted into bicarb. So that's one reason why you may use that occasionally. Um, or you could actually just give half normal saline and add in the additional sodium with sodium bicarb. And actually that helps to balance it out as well. So one thing just to consider with that. Um, and then obviously if they're bleeding, as I mentioned before, like with trauma patients, you know, give them blood transfusions and that will help out. Cause again, um, I can give the patient all the fluid in the world, but if I'm not, they don't have any hemoglobin, that's, they're not gonna be delivering much oxygen, right? So um, in terms of renal replacement therapy, there are, as I mentioned, different modalities, either there's continuous, there's intermittent, uh, you get sort of peritoneal dialysis. We'll talk about that as being more for like chronic management. We'll talk about that in the chronic kidney disease section a little later on. Um, but I, I like to use this mnemonic to remember sort of the common indications for dialysis and it's basically the, the uh, vowels of the alphabet. And so um, A-E-I-O-U, so you can use A for acid-base abnormalities. Dialysis can be used basically to help regulate um, uh, acid-base status and can fix a lot of acidoses. Um, you can use it for electrolyte imbalances so you can pull things off like potassium potentially, you can help to fix sodium levels, you can do a lot of uh, electrolyte shifting with that. When we get into chronic kidney disease, we'll find there's some things that don't get pulled off very well, things like calcium and phosphate, which will be an issue for those patients. We can use it for certain intoxications, and we know what kind of intoxications may be referring to. I mentioned a few earlier. You do for lithium. You do for aspirin. We'll do it sometimes for toxic alcohols, like uh, if you drink a bunch of rubbing alcohol, you could do it. You could do it for ethylene glycol, methanol, different things like that. Where do you find methanol? It's windshield washer fluid, right? I think we see a whole lot of that down here. Not really, we don't have a lot of icy windshields for the most part, so you don't see this frequently, but if you go up north, you'll see a heck of a lot more of it. Um, so certain types of uh, toxic exposure you can actually help to pull off with a dialysis machine, which can help to expedite their recovery. Uh, fluid overload, you can pull off extra fluid for those patients if you need to, which is good. Um, basically with the machine, you can set how much fluid balance you're gonna have. If you wanna take some off, add some in, or just keep it uh, neutral. And then uremia can also be another indication here. So those are the common ones that you run into of reasons why we'd start dialysis. Um, looking at from a pharmacologic standpoint, some of the things you want to consider are going to be the changes in the pharmacokinetics of the drugs that you're administering. So thinking about things like how might the volume distribution change for a patient with acute kidney injury, right? So they have acute kidney injury, let's say they're aneuric, they're not producing any urine. What do you think would happen in terms of volume distribution, say for like a hydrophilic medication? All that fluid starting to back up, so they're going to the interstitium, what happens to volume distribution? It's going to go up, right? You have a bigger bucket to fill. You have a bigger tank, essentially, that the drug is uh, distributing into. Um, so look at things like their volume status. Look at things like they're having significant burns. I mean, they're dehydrated. Maybe you're going to concentrate and that volume distribution will lower. Um, and this is a big consideration for us in terms of antibiotics for septic patients because we may start really aggressively in terms of giving them things like, you know, vancomycin, aminoglycosides, you know, uh, cefepime, things like that. Um, but we got to watch what the renal function is doing and adjust as needed because it's very easy to overdo it and give these patients way too much and then they they have further nephrotoxicity as a result of that. Um, and again, no agents here have been established that can actually treat acute kidney injury, so you gotta try to prevent it, try to recognize it, and try to mitigate it as best you can when you, when you see it. Okay, um, I'm kinda tired of talking. I'm gonna see if there's any questions. <laughs> you guys mind going early, to lunch early? Yeah, I, I didn't think so. We'll talk about mannitol later. I have a funny story about that next time. But let me see if there's any questions on the board. Okay, uh, what would be the initial fluid rate of NS for treatment of HNS? HNS standing for? Okay, um, that's a good question. What do you guys think? Was this like a question on a test recently or something? No. It's like when I have such specific questions, I sometimes think you guys have like an ulterior motive. You know, trying to pit me against another faculty member. <laughs> Um, that depends. Usually you end up finding uh, for those patients, at least the last time I have encountered this, is that typically because they're so hyperosmotic that they will frequently cause a lot of diuresis as a result of that. So you'll find a lot of that extra um, solute in the kidneys will actually draw a lot of fluid off. And so you may need to just kind of consider what their volume status is initially. You really can't go wrong as long as they are not uh, fluid overloaded to start at a typical maintenance rate. Um, you know, how do you figure that out for kids? What's the maintenance rate for fluids for kids? Remember the rule? 
421, right? Fluid bolus is 20 mLs per kilo, but use 421. For adult patients, that typically equates to about 125 mLs per hour is kind of a general rate you'll see. Um, that's based off of getting roughly two to three liters of fluid a day is where you get the 125 mLs an hour. Um, so basically, you're just gonna titrate to see kind of where they're at. Their volume depleted, give them a bolus, start them off on a maintenance rate, and you can kind of see and go from there. So I if that really answers your question or not. What kind of fluids would you give them? Dextrose containing fluids? Probably not. Probably the dextrose is a little, the glucose is a little high to begin with. But. Anyway, uh, okay, any other questions? If not, enjoy your lunch and I will see you all later.